I hope you had a great time exploring this virtual environment. Please type in the chat what you did during the break. Share your experiences with others. We're excited to launch the second of three program sessions in the Pathways to Wellness and MS Nutrition series. This next session, Eating Well with MS, highlights a deeper understanding of the types of food that make your body feel its best, how to interpret nutrition labels, and build a healthy plate and more confidence on your grocery store runs for foods that fuel you, won't cost a ton, and can help conserve your energy. I don't know about you, but that's exactly the kind of information that I'm looking for. Type in the chat one thing you learned from our first session that you didn't already know and now plan to use in your journey through understanding nutrition and eating well. Now, if you missed the first session in today's program, don't worry, the recording will be available on demand on the Society's website and in this virtual environment after today's live program ends. Now, we encourage you to engage with and support each other in the chat throughout the program. Our MS navigators are also in the chat to provide answers and share resources and support. The breakout sessions at the end of today's program also offer you opportunities to come on camera, connect face-to-face -face with presenters and other attendees. So this is your program and participating in engagement opportunities like this during the sessions and breaks is important to your experience. Now I'd like to thank our sponsor, Genentech, for helping us reach our goal to offer this program. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mona Bostic. Mona Bostic is a registered dietitian and MS certified specialist with a private practice in Greensboro, North Carolina. Because she has lived with MS since 2008, she truly understands the challenges of living with MS. In her practice, Mona works with clients one-on-one -on -one, as well as in small group coaching program. And, it's, and she's passionate about sharing evidence-based MS nutrition information. You can learn more about her in our speaker hall. It's so fun to have someone living with MS as a presenter today. So thanks for being with us here, Mona. Absolutely, thank you. I'm so happy to be here to talk about nutrition and multiple sclerosis. Uh, before we get started, let's briefly summarize the points that Dr. Yadav laid out in the first general session. Current research into specific diets, including the ketogenic, paleo, low carbohydrate, Mediterranean or low sodium diet is limited and inconclusive. There is no best diet for people living with multiple sclerosis. Uh, and this may lead uh, you to think that how we eat has no impact on how we live with multiple sclerosis, but that is just not true. There's actually quite a bit of evidence to suggest that how we eat and engage in other health promoting behaviors can have a significant impact on how we live with MS, just not in the way that you might think. As we mentioned in session one, there is abundant research that suggests comorbid health conditions, which means living with a chronic health condition along with multiple sclerosis, have a significant impact on health outcomes with multiple sclerosis. Poorly managed comorbidities are associated with an increase in disability and a decrease in quality of life. Nutrition and other healthy lifestyle behaviors like exercise, stress management, and good sleep play a large and impactful role on conditions that we talked about, like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and others. So while it may not be uh, how or for the reason we imagined, eating well is an important part of living well with multiple sclerosis. But what does it even mean to eat well? That's such a confusing topic. There's so much conflicting and confusing information out there. It can be tough to know what to believe or where to start. Uh, take a moment and think about where you are right now. Do you feel overwhelmed or confident when you think about your food choices? Do you understand how to identify healthy foods? Is going to the grocery store a source of anxiety and stress? Share with others in the chat your current experience with healthy eating up to this point. 
So let's spend a few minutes talking about what it means to eat well. And before we get into the specific food information, let's review some of the rationale for the guidance around specific foods. The very foundation of eating well is adequacy. In other words, we might ask ourselves, is my eating pattern adequate? An eating pattern that is, is the way that you eat and the foods that you choose. Am I eating enough calories, which is also known as energy? Maybe I'm familiar with the idea of food and calories, which come from macronutrients like protein, carbohydrates, and fat. But what about other important nutrients? We may ask ourselves, uh, am I eating in a way to get adequate micronutrients like vitamins, minerals, fiber, and water? Am I eating macronutrients and micronutrients in a balanced way? Do the foods I eat help my body function at its best? If we're able to answer yes to all of these questions, then we come to the question of variety. Do our meals in include a variety of vegetables, proteins, and carbohydrates? Variety really matters. This is because each food source brings with it a uh, different nutrient profile and it contributes a variety or diversity of nutrients to your eating pattern. For example, equal measures of salmon, chicken breast, tofu, kidney beans, and non-fat plain yogurt, uh, excuse me, plain Greek yogurt provide protein, but each offers a variety of other important nutrients as well. Truly, variety is the real superfood. Finally, then we consider flexibility. Flexibility is what has allowed humans to survive over the millennia despite constantly changing food sources. Throughout history, including periods of famine and food scarcity, humans have found ways to adapt. Flexibility allows us to eat in situations that might not strictly align with our thoughts on food. And let's go over a few examples. Imagine you're traveling and the flight has just been delayed. You were stuck at the airport and are starving, but the food is notoriously well, not great. What do you do? You eat. That's because skipping meals in search of health perfection uh, will likely give you a headache and make you feel worse. Another example, uh, you're planning on a night out with family or friends and the menu involves foods that sound delicious. Uh, you're really excited to enjoy time with your friends, but you worry that these foods may not be the best for your health. So what do you do? You eat, you go, you enjoy. You enjoy the time with your friends. That's because a truly healthy eating pattern is built around food that is both physically and emotionally nourishing. Connecting with friends and family over food is important and good for your health. Being able to eat in any situation we find ourselves in, yes, even at a, at a travel rest stop is important. Flexibility is how we do this. Eating patterns that are built around rigid food rules may be depriving us of adequacy, balance, and variety and flexibility, and indicates that they're not actually serving us very well. Are there any food rules that you follow that may be considered rigid? If so, comment in the chat. So now that we have talked a bit about the guiding principles of eating well, let's talk about some actual food. The American Heart Association encourages an eating pattern that includes and is built around a variety of colorful vegetables, fruits, lean proteins, beans, legumes, nuts and seeds, whole grains more often than not, heart healthy unsaturated fats, low calcium foods for bone health, excuse me, low fat calcium foods for bone health, while limiting saturated fats, sodium, added sugars, and highly refined foods, and then avoiding entirely trans fats. Remember that variety is just as important as quantity, and maybe we see this list and it feels familiar, but we wonder which foods provide the most energy, which foods provide the most protein, and so on. So let's see if we can make some sense of it all. What is the difference between macronutrients and micronutrients, and why does it even matter? Macro means large, and as their name suggests, these are nutrients we need to eat regularly and in fairly large quantities. These naturally include water and nutrients that provide energy. There are three macronutrients that provide energy. They do so in the form of calories. And these are protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Uh, there is variability in the recommended range of amount of protein, fat, and carbohydrates that can be consumed. And this will uh, fluctuate from person to person. 
This is to reflect that we are each a bit different and we are also flexible. Protein consumption is recommended to be between 10 and 30% of your total intake, carbohydrates from 45 to 65%, and fat from 20 to 35% daily. So for just for example, a 2000 calorie per day breakdown, this looks like two to 600 calories from protein, 900 to 1300 calories from carbohydrates and 400 to 700 calories from fats. Speaking of percentages, water makes up 45 to 75% of our body weight. <clears throat> it regulates our body processes, body temperature, carries nutrients to our cells and carries waste products away. So how much do we need? The adequate intake of total water for our adults is between 11 and a half cups and 15 and a half cups per day. This includes the fluids that we get from foods and beverages. Water is an important part of health, a health promoting eating pattern, which will help your body to feel and function at its best. Now let's take a closer look at each of the three macronutrients, starting with protein. Protein helps repair and build our body's tissues, allows metabolic reactions like digestion to take place and coordinates bodily functions. In addition to providing your body with a structural framework, proteins also maintain proper pH and fluid balance. They also play an important role in our immune system. Proteins are a part of every cell in the human body and the body recycles proteins daily. So it's necessary to eat an adequate amount of them in your diet and a variety of protein each day to make sure that the amino acid pool is properly replenished. How much do we need? 10 to 30% of your daily intake should be from protein. Adults usually need two to three servings of protein or five to six ounce, one ounce equivalents or five to six ounces. Uh, it's very easy to meet your protein needs with food and supplementing protein is in a generally healthy individual is absolutely not necessary. Having multiple sclerosis does not indicate an increased need for protein. So where can you find lean proteins in your diet? As I, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned, it's pretty easy to meet our protein needs with foods uh, because there's such a variety of sources. You may enjoy protein from lean cuts of beef, pork, lamb, eggs, and poultry, pre preferably with no skin, uh, fish like salmon, tuna, also beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds, as well as low-fat dairy, including yogurt. And because including a protein source on your plate can contribute to a feeling of fullness, it's important to eat protein at each mealtime. Share with one another in the chat your favorite way to consume proteins. And then let's move on to carbohydrates. What exactly are carbohydrates? Um, they are the human body's main source of energy or calories. Carbohydrates include both simple sugars and complex starches. Both are broken down into glucose, which is the most plentiful source of fuel. Remember that 45 to 65% of our diet should be from carbohydrates. We probably know the phrases good carbs and bad carbs, uh, and there is, in fact, a difference between simple and complex carbohydrates. Let's go through that just a bit. Uh, starches are complex carbohydrates that your body breaks down into individual sugars before they can be absorbed. So they break down more slowly than simple sugars. Simple carbohydrates and sugars that contain only one or two molecules of sugar can be broken down very quickly uh, by the body. And they can be used quickly for energy. There are multiple types of simple sugars. Glucose, which can be found in fruits and vegetables, syrups, honey, uh, fructose, which is found in fruit and some vegetables. Galactose is a simple sugar found in milk and milk products. Sucrose, most often called table sugar, is a natural sweetener derived from sugar cane or beet. Lactose is found naturally in milk and in milk products. And then finally, maltose is found in malt beverages like beer. As we can see, simple sugars occur naturally in some foods and are added to other foods as a means of either preserving them or modifying, modifying their taste. Added sugars are the ones that we want to be aware of and to limit. Some common examples of simple sugars are white table sugar, brown sugar, honey, molasses, 
concentrated fruit juice sweetener. Common sources of complex starches are whole wheat breads, rice, starchy vegetables like sweet potatoes, corn, peas, grains like oats, and dried beans as well. Refined grains are complex carbohydrates, but do not contain the bran and germ of the grain. They have a lower nutritional value than whole grain foods, even though they are a complex carbohydrate. Whole fruits contain both simple sugars and fiber, and the combination of both makes them a complex carbohydrate. Fiber is another form of complex carbohydrate. It has an important role in our health because it helps to control blood sugar, blood fats, as well as help you feel full. Uh, it also keeps, uh, helps to contribute to bowel regularity, which is something that many with MS will be interested in and benefit from. In fact, uh, one thing that you should know is that if you are increasing your fiber intake, it's really important to also increase your fluid or water intake because if you consume a lot of fiber without enough fluids, the fiber can actually work in reverse and have a constipating effect. And then last but not least, let's review our final macronutrient, the fats. Um, these are made from varying combinations of fatty acids with different impacts on our health. Dietary fats are essential to give our bodies energy and to support cell function. They also help to protect our organs and keep our bodies warm. Fats help our bodies absorb some nutrients like fat-soluble vit vitamins, including vitamin D, and they produce important home hormones as well. There are four major dietary fats in food. First, the heart-healthy mono unsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, sometimes abbreviated as MUFAs and PUFAs. Uh, MUFAs and PUFAs tend to be liquid at room temperature. Mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids are considered to have health promoting qualities and they're often referred to as the good fats. Examples of these healthy fats include olives, oils like canola, olive oil, peanut, tofu, various nuts and nut butters, avocados, soybeans, and fatty fish. One thing to remember about these good fats is that they provide many health promoting qualities, but they still contain more calories per gram as compared to protein and carbohydrates. It can be very easy to add a significant number of calories by adding too much of these fats. Keep in mind that the recommended uh, fat intake is between 20 and 35% of the calories or 400 to 700 calories per uh, 2000 calorie a day diet or eating pattern. What about the bad fats? I'm sure you've heard of saturated fats and trans fats. They tend to be solid at room temperature like butter. The American Heart Association's updated nutrition guidelines encourage the consumption of liquid plant oils rather than tropical oils like coconut or palm, animal fats like butter and lard, and trans fats, which are solid at room temperature. You will know a product contains trans fats because the label shows that it contains partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. If you see that on the label, choose a different product. An eating pattern that includes lots of saturated fats and or trans fats can raise the bad cholesterol levels in our blood, which is associated with cardiovascular disease. Not only is this bad for our hearts, but cardiovascular disease is a comorbid health condition that con uh, contributes to poor outcomes with multiple sclerosis. So what can we do today? Uh, we can limit, uh, limit the saturated fats like cheese, ice cream, butter, the skin on chicken, fried chicken, poultry skin, and avoid trans fats with the hydrogenated vegetable oil altogether. Share in the chat if uh, one thing that surprised you about good or bad fats. So far, we have reviewed the role of macronutrients in eating well. What about micronutrients? Micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. And compared to macronutrients, micronutrients are required by the body in relatively smaller amounts. Vitamins and minerals work much like spark plugs, triggering chemical reactions or body processes in our body. Uh, each vitamin regulates different processes, and each mineral also has a unique metabolic role. 
Micronutrients do not provide energy, but they often play a role in helping our body use the energy we, we consume in our food. And if we are not consuming adequate amounts of these micronutrients, then our body will not be able to function optimally. So how much of each micronutrient do we need? One way to know this is to use the nutrition facts label. But before we do, let's clear up a bit of confusion about some terms that sound an awful lot alike, but mean different things. Starting with recommended daily allowance uh, or the RDA, which is the average daily level of intake that is enough to meet the nutrient requirements of nearly all healthy people. In other words, this is a population level reference. Uh, the dietary reference intake is a set of reference values for determining our need for vitamins and minerals. Serving size is a standardized amount of food. On the nutrition facts label, this term is often used to quantify the nutrients contained in a given amount of the food or the food product. It is not a recommended portion. Portion is another term that we use. Uh, it is the amount that we serve ourselves and the portion size is the amount of food we choose to eat, which may be more or less than the serving size shown on a food product la uh, label. A quick example of this is that at home, we may serve ourselves two small pancakes and consider that one portion. But at a restaurant, we may get a large stack of five pancakes as one portion. So portions vary. And proportion is the balance of how we serve up one type of food in proportion to other foods. Let's visualize just for a minute if we have a 56 ounce ribeye with a pile of mashed potatoes, we can see that this is not a balanced meal. The proportion of protein to colorful vegetables or fruits is not proportional. Likewise, a large bowl of kale with some olive oil and lemon juice dressing is also not a balanced meal. In these examples, the amount of vegetables to protein, grains or starchy vegetables and other fruit is not balanced. Now that we have reviewed this somewhat confusing terms, let's take a, a look at nutrition facts label to see how we can apply our knowledge. Be sure to look at the number of servings in the container on the nutrition label. Even small containers may have more than one serving. If you eat the whole container, then you must multiply the nutrition values by the number of servings in the container. A couple of great examples of this include Pop-Tarts. Uh, Pop-Tarts are packaged in two tarts to a package, but a serving size is one tart. So if you eat both tarts, you need to double the nutrition information. The calories listed are for one serving of the food. On this label is one of six servings in the package. Labels are typically based on a 2000 calorie a day uh, diet, but your calorie needs may be higher or lower depending on things like age, uh, weight, height, or physical activity level. If you are younger or very active, you will likely need, need more calories or energy as your bodies are burning and using more fuel. If you are older or less active or have a more sedentary lifestyle due to an MS disability, our bodies are likely to need fewer calories. Eating more calories than we need in a day is linked to worsening MS comorbidities. The percent daily value um, shows how much of a nutrient in one serving that this particular food contributes to a daily uh, intake or diet. As a general rule, we know that 5% daily value of or less of a nutrient per serving is low and 20% daily value or higher uh, or more of a nutrient is high. And that's what you want. So the good nutrients you want more of and the bad ones you want less. The nutrition facts label can help you learn about and compare the nutrient content of many foods in your diet. Use this section to help you choose products that are lower in the nutrients you want to limit and higher in the nutrients you may want to get more of. Saturated fats, trans fats, sodium, and added sugars are the nutrients we want less of. Um, diets higher in these nutrients can increase the risk, risk of developing high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, creating comorbidities and multiple sclerosis. The goal here is to get less than 100% daily value of each of these each day. Most Americans do not get the recommended amount of dietary fiber, vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. Diets higher in these nutrients can decrease 
decrease the risk of developing diseases such as high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, and anemia. The goal for these nutrients is to get 100% the daily value on most days. Comment in, uh, below if you use the nutrition facts label to help inform your grocery shopping, or if you plan to now. Just because the serving sizes are mentioned in standard measures like half cup or one tablespoon does not mean we need to weigh or measure our foods. We can use visual cues to guide us and help train our eyes without having to get out the measuring utensils. Here are some common foods and recommended portions to serve. Uh, three ounces of meat, for example, is around the size of a bar of soap, and a computer mouse is the size of an average potato. An eight ball or pool cue ball is about how much half of a cup of rice or ice cream might look like, and two dominoes can represent one ounce of cheese. A light bulb is also another cue for a half of a cup of something like vegetables. Uh, okay, we have covered a lot of information. Let's build a meal. <laughs> uh, to start, let's take a look at the graphic on the screen. Uh, we see that one quarter or less of our plates is filled with lean protein, another quarter of our plate is filled with starchy vegetables or grains, and then the whole other remaining half of the plate is filled with colorful fruits and vegetables. Of course, we should not forget to include low-fat calcium food like low-fat or skim milk, uh, but it's important to know that if for any reason you abstain from dairy, um, make sure the, that your alternative is fortified with vitamin D and calcium. Again, that's really important for bone health. A plate filled like this shows a proportional balance of macronutrients. It also recommends foods that provide sufficient micronutrients, which means that if we build our meals in this way, we will receive enough calories and other important nutrients from our food, which is how the human body prefers to obtain nutrients. MS can definitely present obstacles to meal planning and preparing, and this is another reason why it is important to remember that eating well does not have to be difficult due to restrictive or challenging food rules. These things can create unnecessary obstacles that can confuse or intimidate uh, before we even begin. Eating well can be easier than you think. Having tools helps to make it feel doable. A variety of tools are available to us online. I like to highlight uh, a couple that I use frequently, and one of them, is, one of the free resources is referred to as MyPlate. It's accessible as a website or an app on your phone. It offers a variety of tools like meal planning and meal prep strategies, goal setting, and ways to track your progress. Using resources like this can uh, really simplify information and encourage healthy changes through attainable goal setting small, and taking very small steps forward. It offers easy to understand ways to switch up your meals and choose new foods that offer us better nutrition. To learn more about MyPlate, visit our resource room and share with one another in the chat any tips or tricks that you use to save your energy while cooking. By now, we've learned about healthy types and proportions of food to eat and about how to keep balance, variety, and flexibility at the forefront throughout the journey to eating well. But in practice, the grocery store can still seem incredibly overwhelming. Let's review a couple of ways to tackle our next shopping trip with confidence. In the produce section, our goal is variety and to focus on what is in season for the best bargains. Many produce options also can come pre-chopped or sliced to help you conserve energy while cooking. If you require, for example, just one cup of chopped celery or onions, you might want to consider grabbing that from the salad bar. Uh, doing so will be less expensive, require less space in the refrigerator, and it's another way to conserve your energy. And it's important to remember, especially with multiple sclerosis, convenience is not a bad word. Living alone or having difficulty preparing meals due to MS symptoms like pain, fatigue, fatigue, cognitive challenges, or difficulty with fine motor skills, taking a shortcut here or there may be the only thing standing between a home-cooked meal and ordering takeout. Uh, and to that end, there are many colorful shortcuts in the freezer section at the grocery store as well, including pre-sliced or pre uh, chopped onions, bell peppers, chopped broccoli, kale, 
sliced okra, frozen beans can be easily added to soups, stews, and stir fries for a variety of meals. Frozen fruits are great for smoothies. They are less expensive and available all year long. And frozen fruits and vegetables are just as nutritious as fresh. Uh, something that I get asked about a lot is organic produce. Uh, and it's important for you to know that organic produce as opposed to the conventionally grown has become a hot topic in recent years. Organic is an, uh, the, the term organic is an agricultural designation, not a nutritional one. There's no difference in the nutrition content of organic versus conventional produce. Comment in the uh, chat if your favorite grocery store has a shortcut. Uh, it's commonly said, healthy items in the grocery store are found only around the perimeter, but this is not true either. There are health promoting foods throughout the interior aisles as well. A few examples include beans, oils, nuts, nut butters, canned fruits, uh, canned vegetables, canned meats, and fish. Most foods that are packaged for our convenience come with the trade-off of higher salt, fat, fat, and sugar. There is no right or wrong. Just use the nutrition information label to inform your choices. Armed with information, we can all choose the items that fit into our lives. And it's important to know that canned foods can play an important role in an overall healthy diet. People who eat more canned foods tend to have a higher intake of fruits and vegetables and a higher intake of nutrients overall than people who do not eat uh, use canned foods. They are also convenient and more affordable. Look for vegetables and beans with the lowest sodium options and rinse them off if possible. Uh, and look for fruits uh, in juice with no added sugars. Canned or pouched tuna, salmon, or white meat chicken should be chunk light and packed in water, not oil. Another note, when browsing ingredient labels, look out for anything that ends in the word sugar, like coconut sugar, sweetener, or syrup, as well as any word that ends in O-S-E, agave, honey, and fruit juice concentrate. These are all hidden added sugars. Um, fresh, fr frozen, or canned options are just one more area where variety is important. Consider using all available options based on cost, time, and energy conservation. So what did we learn today? Share in the chat one thing that you can take away from this presentation. We know that there is no best diet for multiple sclerosis and that there are no MS friendly or MS unfriendly foods, but eating well along with moving our bodies and engaging in other health Healthy behaviors is an important part of living well with multiple sclerosis. A health promoting eating pattern helps us to get adequate calories and also enough vitamins, minerals, fiber, and other important nutrients that the body requires to function at its best. It helps us to consume foods in a balanced way, including all of the macronutrients and eat a variety of sources of, sources of nutrients. It allows us to adopt a flexible mindset around food that gives us permission to enjoy meals with friends and find foods during travel and other times where choices may be limited and to live a wholehearted life with food. Thank you again for being here and engaging in this presentation. I hope you have found this information useful and can take some learning with you on your journey through eating well with MS. Thank you so much, Mona. That was a lot of really valuable information. I, I love the focus on flexibility and those tips to help conserve energy of finding chopped vegetables. I'm going to put that into practice. Um, based on this program session, I hope that you all feel empowered and able to understand the benefits of eating a well-rounded diet, that you can identify where you are right now with your nutrition and what healthy additions you can start making to your plate today. We'll now break so you can explore this virtual environment, snap pictures in the photo booth, and earn points on the leaderboard. Have a great time, and we'll see you back here after the break for the third program session, Nutrition, a Comprehensive Approach.